Hello Grizzlies and welcome back to another episode of Grizzly True Crime. My name is Gizzle K and today we continue to look at the case of the Long Island serial killer. If you've had a look at my channel, the, this would be the final part in this episode. I've combined part two and three into one episode today. So I hope you enjoy the show. Uh, please give me a thumbs up if you're only joining now. I hope that you can all hear me okay as well. And thank you again to all my viewers, subscribers, patrons, members, and of course my replay watchers too. Welcome to all my mods. Thank you so much for all your help. It's so nice to have you here as well. Okay, so are we ready? And I see a lot of you watched the movie um, on Netflix, right? It's a pretty good movie. Yeah. Beach background, exactly. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm glad you guys can hear me. Great. So let's get into the case, shall we? I hope that you watch part one which was actually about uh, Shannon Gilbert. And we'll do a quick little recap in this presentation I've made for you, uh, just in case you didn't. But if you didn't, I really hope that you will afterwards, because that was a deep dive on what really started this case. And the intro I just played is about, you know, unsolved or botched cases. Of course, this is an unsolved serial killer case, which is quite scary to think about uh, in uh, the Long Island area. So, yes. The Netflix movie is called The Lost Girls, if you want to check that out. So let me put this on. Okay, the Long Island serial killer known as LISC. That's the acronym that the killer, you know, that they've named the killer by, LISC. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, so this is the quick recap on what we looked at before. Shannon Gilbert went missing on May the 1st, 2010 from Oak Beach, Long Island, after visiting a first-time client, Joseph Brewer. So we're going to look at all the suspects uh, today as well. She made a 911 call at 4.51 a.m. and ran around the gated community, banging on doors and asking for help, saying that they were going to kill her, possibly in her mind referring to Brewer and her driver, Michael Pack. So let me just remove the banner here. Okay. The search for her began one month after her disappearance, which is kind of sad to think about. You know, at first, I don't know if it's because, you know, these were sex workers or I don't know why it took so long to launch the search for her as well as actually, if you think about it, with all the victims' uh, bodies that turned up, with all the remains, wow, they hadn't been looked for either for a long time. And we're talking about um, since 1996. So... That's quite sad to think about. So we want justice for all these victims. Okay, we continue on. The search for her, yes, began one month after her disappearance. Officer John Mullier from Savile County PD and his cadaver dog, Blue, embarked on a search that would last almost two years. So he was very dedicated. Him and his dog, Blue, shout out to Blue as well, searching for almost two years. Blue alerted to the scent of human remains along Ocean Parkway and then the Gilgo Four were discovered. So you might have heard of the Gilgo Four before, and they were the first four victims found in this Long Island serial killer case. So, yes. Okay. Um, eventually, the remains of 10 people, including one man. The man was dressed as a woman, though, right? So that's interesting just to consider. And also a toddler were found before Shannon was found. The police realized that they had stumbled upon the dumping grounds of an undetected serial killer. Oh my word. Searching for Shannon Gilbert evolved into searching for a serial killer who operated for more than 20 years in Long Island and has still not ever been identified. <laughs> Welcome, Annette. Welcome, everyone. Okay, so we go to December 2010. The killer is known as Lisk, the Long Island serial killer the Craigslist Ripper, or the Gilgo Beach Killer. I wonder if it's better if I do this, probably, and you guys can see a little bit better. On December 11, 2010, a routine search led to the discovery of human remains in a burlap bag along Ocean Parkway, close to Gilgo Beach. We will look at the maps again. <laughs> Richard, thank you so much for your $25 super sticker and for saying blue. <laughs> yes, yeah, shout out to blue. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. So remember the burlap bags, okay? Keep these, make, make some notes if you can. The remains were later, even mental notes, okay? The remains were later identified as Melissa Barthelemy's, a woman who went missing from the Bronx on July 12th, 2009, 
after she went missing, her, now again, remember this, her sister received multiple phone calls that taunted and tortured her using vulgar language. For example, I'm watching your sister's body rot. And he also said, I don't know how much this will trigger you too, but are you a whore just like your sister? You know, he said horrible things to her and he called her seven times. They say multiple times. I found out later seven times or oh, at least seven times. More police officers joined in the search and three more victims' remains were found in the Gilgo Beach area. Maureen Brainard Barnes, Megan Waterman and Amber Lynn Costello. So you see, while they were looking for Shannon Gilbert, can you imagine what it must have felt like to actually stumble on now four other sets of human remains? Like, what? That must have been quite scary. The discovery became known as the Gilgo Four and the Gilgo Beach Murders. All four women had advertised their services on Craigslist, and they had all been found wrapped in burlap sacks. They were murdered at another location and dumped along a remote stretch of Long Island Highway, all within a quarter of a mile of each other. Wow. So I read somewhere that the burlap sacks would have been for not only camouflage, but also that the person would have had a lot of knowledge in aiding decomposition based on those. Okay, I'm going to take myself off screen for a second again so you can see everything. So these are the Gilgo Four, the first four uh, sets of human remains that they found in the burlap bags. Maureen Brainard Barnes, she was 25, 4 foot 11, 1.5 meters, 105 pounds, 48 kilograms, and had been strangled. Last seen July 9th, 2007, said she would spend the day in New York City. She's from Norwich, Connecticut, and a friend, Sarah Carnes, also received phone calls from a man who said he'd seen Maureen, that she was alive and actually staying at a whorehouse in Queens. So kind of while phoning the friend at the same time, again, taunting in a way of like, yeah, she was at a whorehouse in Queens. Like, oh my word, I found her, except she's at this place. The friend was very disturbed, um, you know, by this call. The man had no discernible New York or Boston accent and she was a single mother. And then we've got Melissa Barthelemy. She was 24. So you can see the, the 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 victim profile is very similar, especially for the Gilgo Four here, where they the same sort of height and the same body type in general. And they said they all had hazel eyes. Uh, four foot ten, one point four seven meters, ninety five pounds, forty three kilograms, and had been strangled. Went missing July twelfth, two thousand and nine, from the Bronx. Met with a client that night. Her sister received phone calls for five weeks from her phone. The calls were made from various locations in Manhattan. And there were a lot of calls to Manaville on her phone before her disappearance. So Manaville is interesting for later when we look at the suspects. So keep that in mind as well. Sorry, I'm, am I missing a question? Welcome, everyone. If you're just rolling in now, we're looking at the case of the Long Island serial killer. Does anyone know if they recovered Shannon's phone? They did recover Shannon's phone and her purse, and oddly her jeans, which is why I think her case is strange and not just accidental, because they found her jeans as well, with the phone and the purse and everything. So yes, they did. All right, so now we've got Megan Waterman. This is still part of the Gilgo Four. 22, 5'5", 5 5, 1 meter 65, 145 pounds, approximately 65 kilograms, and she had also been strangled. She went missing June 6, 2010. She was from South Portland, Maine. She stayed at a motel in, I don't know how to say that word, Halp Halpage, New York, 15 miles east of Gilgo Beach before she went missing. So here you can see these next two victims, suddenly they're staying a lot closer to Gilgo Beach. She was a mother of one, and she they say she became a victim of, hope you can read that because I can't say that word on YouTube. YouTube will make sure this video goes nowhere, but of um, something to do with traffic. Her pimp was arrested on federal charges of interstate traffic, okay, on April 11, 2012. And then we've got Amber Lynn Costello, 27. So all similar age, similar body type, similar height and everything, as you can see. And, of course, the guy would have been able to, you know, the, the, the killer, scroll Craigslist and find his type. That's how, you know. So... 
Amberlyn Costello, 27, was 4 foot 11, 1.5, 100 pounds, 50 kilograms, and she had been strangled. She went missing on September 2nd, 2010, from West Babylon, New York, 10 miles from Gilgo Beach. A stranger called several times, okay, and then offered her $1,500 for her services, which is almost six times her normal rate. So that's why she decided to do it. She was um, addicted to heroin since she was a teenager, and her family initially believed that she was actually in rehab when she had not responded to their calls or messages. <laughs> thank you, Copper Horse. I see everyone's still saying thank you. Um, Copper Horse bought the, the membership gifting option that's available now. It's a new YouTube feature that they've rolled out to some creators, I believe not all, which is quite great. I, I feel very honored to be part of that. Um, so thank you so much to everyone that's. Um, bought membership gifts. All right. So we've got um, here, I say the search for Shannon and possibly other victims remains. Uh, just hold on. I just want to do it like this. Okay. For other victims remains in the area was paused during the winter months and then resumed in March of 2011. By April the 4th, the remains of four more victims were found. So they found the initial four while looking for Shannon. And then when they resumed their searches, to their shock and horror, they found four more victims just two miles east from where the Gilgo Four were found near Oak Beach and Gilgo Beach. There were two additional victims' remains discovered on April 11, 2011, after the search expanded into Nassau County, five miles west of the Gilgo Four. In total, 10 victims were found in the same area, which became known as the victims of Lisk, the Long Island serial killer, or the Gilgo Beach killer. If any of you are wondering why am I covering this, it's because <laughs> we waited 12 years for the police to release the 911 call that Shannon Gilbert made. And that, of course, caused a lot of speculation. And the reason that the new police commissioner decided to release it was to actually help um, minimize the speculation at this point. You know, and I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure it did. I don't know. But either way, it was amazing that it was released now. And then about two years ago, they also released a video of Megan Waterman checking out of a hotel. So that was also new. So slowly but surely they've released some information um, also about uh, a belt that the potential killer was wearing at the time. They believe it would be connected to the killer. So, you know, I don't know. What I'm learning from this case is um, really, firstly, serial killer cases seem incredibly difficult to solve, to catch the killer. If they, they are a lot. There, uh, apparently, there's around 2,000 serial killers in America right now, not caught, undetected. Can you imagine that? What, what, what? But it must be so difficult to then solve it because it's so much. There's so much to uncover. And you're like, what, what, what? So, yeah, this has taken years. And so that's what triggered me to start covering this. And I'm finding it like, whoa, very interesting to think they were looking for one woman and ended up finding between 10, well, 10 years connected to LISC, 10 and 16 remains. I mean, wow. Okay. So, so here we look. I hope you can see this. Let me put it like this for a second. Here's a case timeline. Uh, that was provided by the Suffolk County Police Department. April 20th, 1996. You see that? Human remains were found. And later, what's interesting there is that it was a, a torso found and legs, dismembered, dismembered body parts uh, wrapped in plastic. And the rest of the body was later found in 2011. Isn't that crazy? Think about that. They like they don't know who that was. They couldn't identify who that belonged to. But then later, they found the rest of the remains <laughs> in 2011. I think that's absolutely crazy. Oh my word. Okay. Hello everyone. Okay. So then November 19th in 2000, Valerie Mack disappears. So this is why the serial killer operated for a very long time undetected. And then Jessica Taylor went missing July 26, 2003. Oh no, she was found then, right? So case timeline. And then multiple victims between July 2007 and September 2010. Shannon Gilbert disappears May 1st, 2010. Remains located December 11th, 2010. And then multiple victims located December 13th, 2010. 
Then they found, um, look at that, from 2003 to 2011, March 29, 2011, Jessica Taylor's remains. April 4th, 2011, multiple victims located. April 11th, more. And then December 13th, 2011, the last victim to be found here was Shannon Gilbert. And she's not actually linked officially, according to the police, to this Long Island serial killer case, which is a huge topic of debate. Wow. <laughs> this case, it's like untangling a web. So here, let's quickly look at these. We've got Jessica Taylor. She was 20. So these are the two other identified victims with pictures, right? Missing since July 21st, 2003. Thank you, Happy Haggies, for your five-pound super sticker. Thank you for supporting the channel. On July 26, 2003, her naked and dismembered torso, missing head and hands, was discovered in Manville, New York. These remains were identified later that year. Okay, so that was identified later this year, but you see um, missing head and hands. Okay, okay. Sorry, trigger warning. It's true crime. It's a, cru a true crime channel. This content is for adults only. Moving along. <laughs> a tattoo had been mutilated with a sharp instrument. On March 29th, 2011, her skull, hands, and forearm were found at Gilgo Beach. So to me, it means that, whoa, this serial killer started in one area and then found a better place to dump remains, which would be around the Gilgo Beach area. Hello, Tom. Thank you for your $2 super sticker. Welcome to the chat, everyone. So they say she had worked in Washington, D.C. and Manhattan as a sex worker. And then we've got Valerie Mack. I couldn't find Jessica Taylor's exact uh, weight and height and stuff. That's why it's not put in there. Valerie Mack, 24, 5 foot, uh, so 1.5 meters, 100 pounds, 50 kilograms. Missing since spring or summer 2000 from Philadelphia. November 19, 2000, a dismembered body was discovered by hikers in Manneville. April 4th, 2011, look at that, 11 years later, a skull, hands, and a right foot wrapped in plastic was found at Gilgo Beach. Identified May 22nd, 2020, as Valerie Mack. What? I'm just like, what? This case. Oh, my word. So I am here. Okay, I am here. I just I just want to make sure that you can see everything really nicely. This is a, a map that we looked at in part one as well, provided by the Suffolk County Police. Um, they say crime scene mapping. And we're going to look at another map in a moment of someone who did an absolutely brilliant job, Dan Denny. Um but look at where all the victims were found. It's along, it's in the Jones Beach area along uh, Gilgo Beach and Oak Beach. Um, so, yes, if you missed part one, go check that out because we did an entire map time as well. It's awful, right? Uh, let's just quickly look. We'll look now no, um, where Manneville exactly is on the map. But wow. Okay, so we'll continue on. Along the road, exactly along the road. So here are the official LISC victims, Long Island serial killer. Victim one, Maureen Brainard uh, Barnes, sorry for the typo. Victim two, Melissa Barthelemy. Victim number three, Megan Waterman. Victim number four, Amber Lynn Costello. Victim number five, Jessica Taylor. Victim number six is Valerie Mack. Victim seven, a toddler girl known as Baby Doe. And this DNA was linked to a Jane Doe known as Peaches. Then victim number eight, an Asian man who was dressed as a woman. And victim nine and ten, a female skull and a bag of female bones, both found in nearby Nassau County. They were all found close to that gated community area. So you can see there's Manneville. Good, good, good. I forgot I had this on there. So Gilgo Beach is where majority of them were found. Shannon Gilbert, um, Oak Beach, and then Manerville. Some of them were also found as we just went over. So that is it on the map. You can just see how far that is apart. In early December 2011, Suffolk County Police found Shannon Gilbert's purse and mobile phone and a pair of jeans in Oak Beach, Marshland. Two days later, a quarter mile east of her belongings, Gilbert's remains were located. She's not considered a LISC victim, according to the police, and is believed to have died from accidental drowning in the marsh that she was found in. However, as you know, her family and family attorney do not believe that. They believe that she was absolutely murdered and is a victim of LISC, also because she was apparently found um, face up, and there were two bones, the two 
um, pointy parts of the hy hyoid bone were missing as well, which would indicate um, homicidal strangulation, also according to their private autopsy, which was performed by a brilliant uh, coroner as well. He's been doing this for decades. This is an undetected serial killer. I mean, there are many of those, but wow. <laughs> yes. Shannon Begley, this is nuts. I know, right? I believe she was a victim. I mean, I'm on the fence with it, but I also think so. Especially when I heard that her jeans were also found. It was kind of like her purse, her, her, her pocketbook, phone, and then also her jeans. Like, do you think she's running and then ripping off her jeans? I don't know about that. Hmm? Wow. So in 2020, former Suffolk County Police Commissioner Geraldine Hart released uh, previously undisclosed evidence to the public in an effort to advance the investigation. Police released photos of a belt believed to be handled by the suspect, not belonging to any of the victims. So they say it's either HM or WH, depending on how you look at it. This is the belt. The picture on the left is more accurate, right? That's a picture of the belt. They say they think it belonged to a large man. I'm like, oh. In 2022, uh, current Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney K. Harrison established a multi-agency task force that includes representatives from the FBI, New York State Police, Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, and the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office to reinvigorate the investigation and bring the person or persons responsible for these crimes to justice. I mean, wow. Yes, we've listened to the entire 911 call. That was also linked. If someone hasn't listened to that yet, please do go listen to Shannon Gilbert's entire 911 call. Yes. Right, Saleh? No, no, no. I don't believe she died accidental. Very difficult to think it's just accidental, right? Okay, so what do we know about the Long Island serial killer? Now, I do love profiling. I love profiling. So this is this is my favorite part of the case. Um, based on common characteristics of the victims and forensic evidence, the police believe that at least 10 victims were the work of one killer, the Long Island serial killer. They believe the span of the crimes was from February 1996 until 2010 or 2013. I don't believe, I don't know why they say all 13, because I'm not, I don't think there's other victims after Shannon, which is also interesting to me, right? That it like stopped there. Joseph Brewer left the community. Um, Peter Hackett, that doctor we looked at before, which we'll look at now, left the community. He moved to Florida. Okay. And then it seems like either the murder stopped or <laughs> it's continuing elsewhere, which is a very, very horrible thought. I bet it was before 1962. It could have been, yes. So modus operandi, strangulation, bludgeoning, and post-mortem dismemberment. Signature, calling the victim's relatives with their cell phones and taunting them. Pathology, he's a stalker and serial killer, according to the profilers. Um, they do not have the DNA of the killer. Um, no, apparently not. Alias, the Long Island serial killer, Lisk, the Gilgo Beach killer, the Ocean Parkway killer, the Craigslist ripper, the Seashore serial killer, the Gilgo killer, and the Long Island ripper. Out of 10 victims, an Asian male who was dressed in female clothing, a toddler, and one female victim remain unidentified. I mean, that's so sad to me when these victims are unidentified. It happens in almost every serial killer case. I mean, there's some victims, there's so many victims, and some are unidentified because, of course, these people target people who might, you know, not have family that report them missing. The identified victims were all sex workers who advertised their services on Craigslist. The Asian male died from blunt force trauma and the baby by undetermined means. The killer speculatively strangled the victims with a belt. A picture of the belt was released in January on January 16, 2020. Why the Craigslist killer? Because... Um, most of the victims advertised their services on Craigslist. So he probably found them on Craigslist. You know, they advertised their services on there. It's it's very much rainbow bright. It's very much like the Golden State Killer. And I've actually seen articles where they think he could have even done this. <laughs> some of this. Can you imagine that? Joel Rifkin, the Golden State Killer, and some other serial killers 
are possible suspects in this. But Joel Rifkin is saying, nope, 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 he had nothing to do with it. So, hmm. Uh, so Jim Clement, a former FBI supervisory special agent of profiler and former New York State prosecutor and producer on CBS's Criminal Minds, believes that this killer was be between his, or somewhere in his mid-20s to late 40s, of course, at the time of the crime. So I would say back to, what, 1996, right? Is married has a, or has a girlfriend, is organized, is an organized killer, right? Um, is well-educated and well-spoken, has a stable job, owns an expensive car or truck, is very familiar with Jones Beach Island, where he possibly lives or used to live, is very familiar with Ocean Parkway, has access to burlap sacks, may have knowledge of law enforcement techniques, or may have been a police officer himself. This is according to a very well-known uh, profiler. Example, his calls to Melissa's sister did not last long enough to pinpoint his location and were made from crowded places like Times Square, where it was even more difficult to track the phone. Is likely a sexual sadist? Well, I would think so, right? He has a pattern of striking in the summer months, maybe a fantasy or maybe a time when family are away for the holidays. Yes. So you can still call today. The tip line is still open, 1-800-220-TIPS. Uh, these are actual pictures from when they were searching and, and finding, unfortunately, so many so many victims remains. Um, Saleo, we're going to go over that right now, today, right now. Okay, so I combined part two and three. We're getting to the suspects next. With that doctor, whoo. Oh, man. So here we're going to look at this. So they say other profilers include that he may have been treated in hospital for a poison ivy infection in the past. Now, then I asked why. <laughs> and I dig, dig, dig. And oh, because he left the victims in a 10 mile stretch of remote poison ivy covered dunes. I don't know they were poison ivy covered. So that's another reason why they probably weren't discovered so easily. And whoa, how did he get in and out of there? He must have been very experienced with this just off Ocean Parkway on Jones Beach Island. Serial killer experts uh, say they believe the current killer is fueled by similar impulses as shown by his desire to call the teenage sister of one of his victims using the victim's cell phone and to mock or scare her. This gives me an idea that he's a sadist. That would be uh, reflected in his relationship and jobs. He's the one who laughs when a cat gets run over or a kid falls off his bike. He likes the suffering of others. And he really likes it when he can cause or witness it. That's what Jim Clement believes. Joel Rifkin, a convicted serial killer, says that he thinks it would be someone like a landscaper, contractor, or fisherman. Ooh, I'm also leaning towards fishermen just because of those, um, you know, those fisherman pants they can wear. Could definitely walk through that poison ivy with that on, right? Yes, I also wonder if he knew that beforehand. I mean, he might have, which is why I'm also thinking landscaper or fisherman. I mean, Joel Rifkin might not be that far off with this. This is someone who can walk into a room and seem like your average Joe, said Scott Bond, an assistant professor of sociology at Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, and a serial killer researcher. He has to be persuasive enough and rational enough that he's able to convince these women to meet him on these terms. He has demonstrated social skills. He may even be charming. So the thing is, of course, they are advertising their uh, services for sex work on Craigslist. So I think they're used to meeting a lot of dodgy guys, right? Maybe guys and girls, <laughs> right? And so they might be quite desensitized to the creepers. But they make a good point that he would need to be, you know, able to communicate enough uh, for them to think, okay, cool, yeah, I'm going to go meet up with this person, right? Yeah, these killers are among us. That's so scary. <laughs> it's Renee. Tell the story. <laughs> Do you guys want to hear the story of Renee? <laughs> oh man. We might do let's just see what's next. Okay, so we've got the persons of interest next. Okay, so we've got this here. Let's remove this. Let's just do this like this. <laughs> Quick story of Renee. This is a name that I call this man, this creeper who was in literal, I call them swamp pants, fisherman pants, okay? In the middle of the road, in the dark, two nights before Halloween, two years ago. Mr. Grizzly and I went on a night cycle that had nothing to do with Halloween, just a little night cycle. We cycled, this old man 
jumped into the road. So there was only one street light and it was dark everywhere else. There's one road and some little path veers off and we didn't know the area. We didn't know what that little path was. So there's one street lamp. Okay. So this old man jumps into the middle of the road and he goes like this. So we're like, uh, okay. So Mr. Grizzly is like, turn around, turn around. <laughs> but me being a true crime man, a little bit curious, I was just like, this is interesting. That was interesting physiology. Let's just go see what he wants. Maybe he really needs help. Should have turned around. Anyway, so trust, trust that gut instinct. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm a little desensitized. Yeah, he literally, he was obviously hiding in the bushes. And when he heard our bicycles, jumped into the middle of the road. Kind of like, like literally jumped into the middle of the road. That's how I describe it. Went like this, okay? So we cycled towards him. Um, and then as we got there, he put his arms around Mr. Grizzly, my husband, in case you guys don't know who Mr. Grizzly is. He put his arms around him and then suddenly became like this old, creepy, frail man who was like breathing in his face and talking and like in Dutch really fast. <laughs> and Mr. Grizzly was just like, what? And remember, these are the days where we had to wear masks all the time. So I was like, this man who's probably in his 70s is now suddenly in his face like this. And he made like, I'm invisible. I didn't matter to him at that moment. He only cared about him. So he was telling him, please, can you help me? I dropped my keys and it's just down here. But what I need you to do is bring your bicycle so I can use the light, which is not bright at all on our bicycle, just to find my keys. That's the moment my true crime knowledge at least then kicked in. Okay, the gut instinct at first, I'm like, this is very interesting. <laughs> it's like meeting Pennywise. Ooh, should we go closer? Anyway, so uh, I said to Mr. Grizzly, no, 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 no. We got to, no, this is an ergo. And then he like looks at me. He's like, okay, get ready. So I'm like, I'm ready. And we both put our little feet on the pedals and we're like, three, two, one. And we started cycling and we cycled as fast as possible away from him. Now, from that old, frail mannerism he had, he suddenly stood up and he was strong again and everything, right? And he shouted like, hey, like, where are you going in Dutch? And he was very, very angry. And that's the story of Rene. But the thing is, <laughs> the next day, me being curious, I want to know, well, what was that place? So we cycled it again, also to help us overcome the PTSD from this incident. I don't want to be afraid of it forever. And we were horrified, absolutely horrified. And I have to tell you one more thing about his outfit. Horrified, because we cycled there. And as we looked down the path, it was a dirt road leading into the woods. There's nowhere to park there. There would have been no cars there. And this guy was in full swamp pants, full fishing gear, that material that's uh, waterproof fishing boots i would call like swamp boots rain boots and he had on a plastic he looked like dexter man he had on a plastic um raincoat see-through transparent plastic under a jacket with another raincoat on top and i saw that little raincoat flapping in the wind behind him you couldn't see it from looking at him from the front but from me looking at him from behind i could see this guy is dressed like dexter He's like literally dressed to kill. Now, yes, I reported him. I phoned the police. Okay, this is a side story in the middle of this episode. I phoned the police and they thought I am ridiculous. They're like, this doesn't happen here. Where are you from? I'm like, South Africa. They're like, oh, no, that's not like that here. And I'm like, what? This can happen anywhere. And I'm telling you, that is my, <laughs> this is my truth, that I crossed paths with a potential serial killer that night. <laughs> I call him Rene because I looked through, I scoured the internet for all the missing persons um, in the Netherlands. And I actually found a profile that matched the face because I remember faces like anything. Okay. I will, I can draw him right now. Okay. <laughs> so I found a face that looked like, a, I would say an 80 to 90% match of his face. And it's actually a person who has been missing from the coast an hour and a half away. Um, he's been missing from there since for like two years. And they say, he may have dementia or something and may be lost, but they have no idea where he is. He was so scary. So that's my Renee story. <laughs> okay. Yes, never give out a phone number on a live chat. What, 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 what? Okay, that's the that's the story, everyone. So shall we continue with the Long Island serial killer? So yes, I believe it does happen everywhere in the world. I, where was it in the Netherlands? It was literally here in... Um, the Utrecht area. So I can't remember what that exact area was called by the woods, but close to where we live, very close. 
that was so scary. And I just want to say one more thing before we look at these persons of interest is, for instance, I reported on a missing person. I think it was on Instagram and I may have made a short here on YouTube um, about this lady who left a bar and crossed through a park. This was about four months ago. She crossed through a park uh, to go home and then she sent her friends her location pin and they were like, what the hell? So they went there and found her clothes and her purse and everything, but not her. And then like two weeks later, uh, her body was found in the canal. And then are the, are, are the Dutch police really going to tell me that's just, <laughs> they don't say it's a, a killer on the loose or someone killed her or someone did something. It's just what she fell into the water or what? There's no hype. There's nothing about it. It's like, oh. So anyway, that's the story. Now let's look at the, the persons of interest, shall we? Back to the Long Island serial killer. Are we all good? Are we focused? <laughs> okay. The possibility exists that Jones Beach, Gilgo Beach, Oak Beach, and surrounding areas were the dumping grounds of multiple serial killers. There is that possibility. They're saying this could be the work of many, not just one, either operating together or separately, because the MO seems to change slightly. Okay, but I just think it's someone evolving. If you think of, if it was one person starting in more like Fire Island, New York, Manaville, and then that would be like dismemberment and plastic. And then later to burlap sacks, like, I don't know. I just think they, they evolved a little bit, don't you think? I remember hearing about bodies found, but the only details I know is what you're telling us today. So we know if toxicology was able to be done or too far gone for that. Are oh, we talking about this case right here? I don't know. I think the remains were very decomposed, right? Yes, we all have to watch our backs. Exactly. Jeanette, we are in days when we all have to watch our backs and be safety conscious. It's not being... I mean, I am I call myself hyper-vigilant. I am hyper-vigilant, and I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's wisdom. I don't think it's a disorder or like, oh, my word, just calm down, because there's danger all around us. And once you see it, you can't really unsee it. That's the problem. So rather safe than sorry, and maybe you could even help someone else. You know? So now let's look at Michael Pack. He was the driver that took Shannon Gilbert to Oak Beach. Uh, she was saying on the phone, they're going to kill me. They're trying to kill me. And she even said, you were in it all along. That's what she was saying, right? On the phone. Shannon Gilbert's driver briefly considered as a suspect in Shannon's disappearance since he was one of the last persons to see her exonerated following a poly polygraph test. So he wasn't, he's not considered a suspect anymore. Interesting. Now, James Bissett. He ran a nursery. He looks really sweet here. James Bissett, huh? He ran a nursery, which was the main supplier of burlap in the Long Island area. Now, he unalived himself shortly after, and I mean two days after Shannon Gilbert's remains were found. I think that could just be coincidental. What do you guys think? I don't know. Two days after they found Shannon Gilbert's remains? Two days. I mean, they found all the others. So it's not like two days after they, they or even two days after they found the Gilgo 4 in the burlap sacks. Then he unalived himself. No. After everyone was found, then they found Shannon. Two days later, he unalived himself. I feel like he, that I feel sad for him. And I think, I think it's a bit of a coincidence. What do you think? Right. Then we've got Joseph Brewer. Now this is the client that Shannon went to meet. Why are we talking about Shannon only? Just because that's the last clue we have. That's the one, this is the case that uncovered this entire case. You know what I mean? So Hired Shannon by Craigslist for May 1st, 2010. 8 Fairway Oak Island. Shannon was dropped off at his house at, uh, I spelled off wrong there. I don't know, type fast, right? At his house at approximately 2 a.m. on May 1st, 2010. He says that Shannon left his house hysterical. A lie detector test came back as inconclusive. So there's a red flag. He repeatedly denied involvement. PD has said he has not said he's a suspect. He moved from the neighborhood shortly after police raided his house. So they raided his house much later, unfortunately. I think it was two years afterwards. It was, uh, wait, from May 2010 until December 2011. Wow. Like much, much, only after they found Shannon Gilbert's remains that they raided his house. But then afterwards he sold his home and left. And his family owns many homes on Long Island. So that's interesting too. We're going kind of from... 
from the least possible suspect to the most, in my mind, from what they've listed. So Michael Peck and uh, the Bissett guy, the nursery man, James Bissett, to me, they're the least likely suspect. Joseph Brewer, we're warming up, we're warming up. Mm -hmm. We're getting to the, yeah, we're getting to the doctor. Okay, then we've got James Burke. He was the former Suffolk County Police Chief. Was said by a sex worker that he paid to have sex with to be connected with a list case due to the violent attitude that he displayed towards another woman and herself. Now, I don't remember where I read that story, but it was very graphic. How he talks to sex workers is horrendous. Like, just the way he, wow. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that now. He was reported to have blocked an FBI probe into the list case during his time as a police chief. Now, that's not something I'm saying. This, this is now from the news, from the articles and everything. It's very interesting that he was kind of an obstacle in the case. Yes, and welcome to Lieutenant Peter Pronzo and Rochelle Pronzo as well. Yes, Jeanette, we're going to get to that now. He was considered as a suspect by Shannon Gilbert's family's attorney. He was charged in February 2016 of civil rights violations and conspiracy to obstruct justice for beating a man who stole his, his sex toys and pornography. So he had a duffel bag in his car filled with sex toys and pornography. And this dude, who was a drug addict, opened the car and stole the duffel bag. And this guy beat him Oh, yeah, he, he assaulted him and intimidated him. And because of that, he was sentenced to 46 months in federal prison, along with three years of supervised uh, release in November 2016. He is quite a red flag because remember they said he, the, the killer probably has knowledge of how law enforcement uh, processes work and all that. So interesting. And this James Burke was also at more parties in Oak Beach at uh, one of the houses after all of these victims were found. That story of how he talks to sex workers, I believe, if I jog my memory now from what I saw, is literally after all of this. I mean, that's that's quite hectic as well, right? Okay, so, so he, he's an interesting one. And then we get to... Dr. Peter Hackett, to me, he's like the reddest flag because of the phone call thing. He was the community's emergency services guy, their security guy. He was the neighbor of Joseph Brewer. He was a physician who once worked for the Suffolk Police Department. Okay. He has a reputation of inserting himself into major events. Uh huh. He wants the spotlight. He's even, people say he's a bit of a wannabe serial killer. Even that's weird. He could just be a wannabe. The belt initials were HM or WH. Um, he called Shannon's mother twice from his wife's phone after her disappearance. Now think about it. Where the hell did he get Shannon's mother's number? Hmm? It must have been from her phone or what? Or where, where, or where? Or maybe from the phone book, I guess, in those days. I don't know. Maybe he just had it. But it's weird to me that he decided to call Shannon's mother twice from his wife's phone after her disappearance to tell her that he ran a halfway house for wayward girls and was looking after her, even medicating her. And then he denied ever making those calls. He absolutely denied it until public records showed no, you really did make those calls. He's like, oh, well, I didn't say that I was running a house for wayward girls. I didn't say anything about meeting her. We're going to look at his letters now, too. In two letters to CBS's 48 Hours in 2011, he denied ever seeing Shannon that night, um, but said he had called the family to be supportive after getting uh, Mary's number from, from Shannon's boyfriend and driver when the pair came to the neighborhood to look for Shannon in the days after she disappeared. So, yes, Michael Pack and her boyfriend got in the car, went back to Oak Beach to look for her days after she disappeared. Couldn't find her, right? So that's interesting. And he says <laughs> he got Mary's number from Shannon's uh, boyfriend. This 
Dude also sold his house and moved to Fort Myers, Florida. After after uh, Shannon was found. Rob, thank you so much for your $10 super sticker. Gizla, this is for all your hard work on this case. Thank you so much, Rob. Rob knows. <laughs> I've been working my butt off on all this because it's a lot to untangle quickly. Normally, if I was writing a book like I did with the four serial killer books I wrote, which I believe you know was my speciality, studying serial killers. Um, yeah, it's a lot to unpack. This is just what I can present on YouTube that'll make sense as well to you guys and be enjoyable for you as a show. But oh my word, there's a lot, a lot to unpack in this case. See, the thing is, these people were questioned. He was ruled out as a suspect. Now, how? Why? 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 I don't know. I don't understand. Because I'm going to show you his letters now, and then you're going to see why I'm like, wait, what? He now lives in Fort Myers, Florida. Shannon's mother filed a wrongful death lawsuit against him in, I believe it actually was 2012. I wrote it 2013, but I think it was in 2012. But it was dismissed in 2018. And that's sad because she was murdered, in case you didn't see part one. Shannon's mother was murdered by one of Shannon's sisters. The sister suffered from schizophrenia and was hearing, you know, voices telling her what to do. And she murdered her mother. So her mother was fighting for Shannon's justice. You know, and that that was a whole another plot twist. Like, wow. Yeah, Dr. Hackett, everything was traceable. Hmm. So the, this is the most likely suspect to me. And then there's this one as well. Actually, I put this one last because John Bitroff. Bitroff? Wait, Bitroff. Did I spell that right? Yes, Bitrolf. John Bitrolf. Bit Rolf, it's R-O-L-F-F. -F. Okay. Suffolk County local who was found guilty in 2017 of murdering two sex workers in 1993 and 1994 and is suspected of murdering a third, which would make him a serial killer then. On September 12th, 2017, it was announced that Bit Rolf was also a suspect in one of the Gilgo Beach murders. And he lived in Manaville. Oh my word, at the time the first victims of the Gilgo Beach killer died? Okay. He's also the, well, they say the daughter of one of Bitrolf's known victims was best friends with Melissa Barthelemy, one of the Gilgo victims. So to me, this is actually the most likely suspect. What do you guys think? This one is like, oh my word. The doctor's name was Peter Hackett over here, Dr. Peter Hackett. We looked at a clip of his last time, but then I got copyright claimed for that. So I can't show it again now. <laughs> it really impacts my episodes then. Even though it's fair use and I talk, you know, all the time, it just, yeah, no. So it is so complex. Yep, it's so complex. But this one, whew, this one, this dude who's already found guilty of murdering two sex workers, and they also advertise on Craigslist, and they suspected of murdering a third, and then Manival whoa okay and then connected to one of the victims this is that's a lot that's a lot of red flags right mm. definitely two suspects here interesting well yes i mean the this case and i cannot believe i mean it's so shocking to think all these bodies were found and it's an it's still unsolved i mean three of them are still unidentified whoa the long island serial killer lisk i hope you enjoyed my presentation <laughs> hope you did now i want to show you the letters i wonder if i could um let's do a quick break oh well, just i won't i'll just do this one quickly my new little be right back hold on <laughs> Just when I quickly got to do something, <laughs> my little elevator music. Okay, so here they say 48 hours mystery. This is what makes Dr. Um, Packett 
quite the red flag too. Shannon Gilbert was last seen in Oak Beach, New York. Shannon's family claims Dr. Peter Hackett, a resident of Oak Beach, called him to say he had seen Shannon and taken her into his home the morning she vanished. Dr. Hackett then took it upon himself to write two letters to 48 Hours, denying that he had seen or treated Shannon and explaining why he telephoned the family. I mean, he just had to write these letters. And look, how, look what he writes. C. Peter Hackett, Oak Beach, New York, 11702. Mar sorry, May 29th, 2011. All right. May 29th, 2011. Okay. 48 hours CBS News, right? So it's say, Dear Miss Moriarty, any important story is worth getting right. In response to your letter, I will share only the facts I am aware of. When I heard the name of a person named Shannon Gilbert, she was already missing. I never met her. I never treated her. I'm just saying this was before they found a body, right? From everything I just remember and all the whole presentation. <laughs> this guy's writing this letter and he's like, I never met her. I never treated her and I never spoke with her. She was never in my home. I greeted the people looking for her by chance. I recall the first people were Mike and Alex. So Michael Pack, Alex, the boyfriend. I provided them with my calling card. Should I be able to help and encourage them to follow up with the police? I returned a call as requested. Since I had never met Shannon, it obviously did not have anything to do with permission to treat her. It was supportive, and that was all. That call was my was last May, and perhaps that is why it's being reported inaccurately. I also met some of her family. See, that call was last May. That's why it's being reported inaccurately because she went missing on May 1st, 2010. I also met some of her family when they came to our neighborhood on Mother's Day, May 9th, 2010, to post signs and go door to door asking questions. I mean, this dude is now having to bring in Mother's Day. It's like, red, this is Red Flag Station right here. This is like, wait, what? Like, it's oversharing. It's like in an interrogation when they ask people questions and they overshare, like, did you go to McDonald's the day or whatever? They'll say no. But someone who's lying will be like, actually, well, I might have gone there, but what I did first was I went to the pharmacy and then after that, all that, yeah, lying <laughs> in general, right? So he says on, on Mother's Day, May 9th, uh-huh, uh-huh. When months went by and nothing was heard, we assumed Shannon must have returned home. I'm sorry that was not the case. I had nothing to do with anything that occurred the night Shannon went missing. I was home, sleeping with my wife. You just have to say what you were doing, right? The police continue their investigation. I, along with many neighbors in this community, have cooperated with them. I will not be granting an interview. Being a parent, I cannot imagine Mrs. Gilbert's pain. My wife and I keep her family in our prayers. One can only hope that the current media attention will assist in some new information that will lead to closure for the Gilbert family. Sincerely, C. Peter Hackett. Yeah, an answer, more <laughs> an answer more than five words is a lie. And then he goes on. He wrote two letters, as if the first one wasn't already like, wait, what? This one is June 28, 2011. Dear Miss Moriarty, I hope this letter answers some of the questions you raised when we spoke last Friday. I had met Shannon's boyfriend, Alex, and driver, Mike, when they came to my community to look for Shannon in the days following her disappearance. I gave them my contact information, should I be able to help in any way. During my conversations with them, they asked that I call the family. My wife and I checked our long-distance phone bills. There's only one bill, which is calls documented to Kingston, New York. It shows that I spoke with Alex on May 6, 2010 at 7.20 p.m. And at 7.25 p.m. I called at his request and spoke with Mrs. Gilbert. We spoke for four minutes. On May 9, 2010 at 12.06 p.m. I called blah, blah, blah. And I, and I think that's obviously the number. I think that was a sister's number. The call was also four minutes. These calls were over a year ago. Now, an exact content is difficult to remember, but at no time during any of my conversations with Shannon's friends or family did I suggest I'd ever met her or rendered medical care of any sort to her. Yes, because the victim's family is going to make that up, right? Some strange call they received. 
Well, as previously mentioned, I met with Mrs. Gilbert, her sisters, her friend and friends in the presence of my guests and family on Mother's Day, May 10, 2010, when they were distributing missing persons posters. We answered questions for them to the best of our ability, and at no point were we dismissive. However, we empathized uh, the need to follow up with the police departments involved, and we parted on friendly terms. I'm perplexed as to why, almost a year later, I became a person of interest to the family and media. I did not even know who Joseph Brewer was until after this incident. Oh, you had no idea who your neighbor was, even though you're the security guy in the community, right? <laughs> Doesn't sound like a good security guy then to me. It wasn't his job. He was just like, you know, he wanted to to be the security dude. I don't know. In May, my wife and I were preparing for both a high school and college graduation. I drove cross country with my eldest daughter to her new job. Again, oversharing. No one asked. And no one asked this, remember? Since we had heard no news about the missing woman, we thought she may have gone home. In December, when the news reported a body found, we realized otherwise. You asked me why I didn't take a polygraph test. I was willing, but learned that certain health issues that I'm being treated for would negate its results and therefore interpretation. Frankly, since I'm not a suspect, it would be a, a waste of time and resources. I'm allergic to dogs, but welcome the cadaver dogs to come through our home and property, and they found no evidence. Once again, I emphasize my fervent hopes that Shannon is found alive, and if there was foul play, that justice can take its course. Don't you find this so weird, guys? <laughs> this letter, oh my word, I'm just like, wait, what, 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 what? I find it quite disturbing. Yes, he needs to, <laughs> Peter Hype needs to do a video on these letters. Yes, he doesn't remember conversations with a mother, but remembers being with his daughter and what they did. Mm, never met. Mm. Total BS, right? Total BS, people. Now, what I want to show you is the map that I said to you, which is, uh, wait for it. Yes, this one. So this is on a site called uh, dandenny.com. And I'm showing it to you because, damn, this guy really mapped it out. Mapping the Long Island murder victims. So if you look at this site, which I've linked in the description box as well. Peter Hyatt's the doctor, Saleo. Peter Hyatt is the doctor. The one you asked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Yes. What's up, Lena? Okay, so they've got the whole case summary here. If you look at it, everything is here. Um, but then they say, look at this map. I found this map so brilliant. So look at this. They go like this. This part of the story begins on November 1st, 1993. On that evening, a woman had been seen hitchhiking in East uh, Patchogue, New York. Her name was Rita Tangredi. So there are some other homicide victims who maybe are suspected to be linked to this list case, which is why they are they are now listed here. So, but just look at the look at the dots. You can see the 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 dot D over here. Hello, where's it? Yeah. Watch how the map lights up as we go. So we go Rita. Tangredi's remains were found in a wooded area on November 2nd, 1993, okay? The details are an important part of identifying her killer. She's been beaten, strangled. A specific item of her clothing was missing, and her body was found in a distinct pose, and wood chips were used to cover her. Then we've got Sandra Costello's remains. I'm just going to go through these relatively quickly because I've linked the website for you to go look at. I want to get to the ones we've just covered, okay? But just look, look at the dots. Just look at it. We're going on. Partial remains of Jane Doe number 7 are found April 20th, 1996. Along Blue Point Beach, people found her legs wrapped in plastic. That's pretty much where we started, right? Then, partial remains of Jane Doe, number three, aka Peaches, are found on June 28th, 1997. Authorities released the information about her tattoo in hopes of identifying her, but there's still not an official match. Her torso was discovered in a green Rubbermaid container. Oh, my word. And then... Partial remains of Jane Doe number six found November 19th. Okay. Uh, torso found wrapped in garbage bags. In addition to her head and hands like the others, her right foot was removed, assumedly to hide a distinguishing mark. And that later found in Gilgo Beach. Then you see the dot coming up. Do you see it? Look, there's no dot. And then suddenly there's a new one. Okay. Right, right here. Partial remains of Jessica Taylor found on July 26, 2003. 
one of the, the LISC victims. She was on a plastic sheet and the killer had removed her head, hands and attempted to obscure a tattoo. We continue on. Look now, we go here. Now we go here. Maureen Brainard Barnes is last seen by a friend on July 9th, 2007. Her friend Sarah left her at the Super 8 Midtown. Maureen said she would stay until that Wednesday, July 11th. And then we go, Melissa Bartholomew. So it's the Gilgo 4 we're looking at now. Last seen by neighbors July 10th. Okay, on her porch talking on her phone. Just look at all these cases. Yes, looking at, it's heartbreaking to see all the victims, I agree. Then Shannon Gilbert, as you can see here, let's just see where that dotty appears there. Right here. And I'm going to take myself off for a second. She ran from a client's house and away from her driver, knocking on doors, calling 911. She went missing and searches for her led to many of the following events. And then Megan Waterman. You see? She'd been staying in a motel, placing ads on Craigslist, and was last seen walking towards a gas station. And then Amber Costello was last seen September 2nd, 2010. I mean, I'm just looking at this map and I'm like, oh my word, police find the remains of Melissa Barthenemy on December 11, 2010. So you can see where they were last seen and where the remains were found. A cadaver dog reacted and an officer found her partially decomposed remains wrapped in burlap. And then look at this. Look, we go up again to see. Look at it. Here we go. Boom. Police find three more sets of remains December 13, 2010. They were later identified to be Maureen Brainard Barnes, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. Like Melissa, they were found um, in burlap sacks and spaced apart pretty evenly. The group became known as the Gilgo Four. And then Jessica Taylor's remains. I mean, that was a case from long ago. Her skull and forearm were matched with her prior remains. So prior to more than a decade before, they found her torso, okay, and legs wrapped in plastic. Now they find her skull forearm matched with her prior remains in that same area. And then here pol police find three more sets of remains, April 4th, 2011. <gasps> this map is so scary. And then baby doe is discovered as part of the group found April 4th, 2011. While she was laid close to one of the other victims, she was later found to be the daughter of Jane Doe number three, aka Peaches, but there were no signs of trauma. Then we've got John Doe, aka Asian male, discovered as part of the group on April 4th, 2011. The only male victim in this group, he died of blunt force trauma and was wearing women's clothing. And then police find two more sets of remains on April 11th, 2011. These remains were later matched to Jane Doe number seven and Jane Doe, Jane Doe number three, aka Peaches. Whew, my word. And then they say, police find the remains of Shannon Gilbert on December 13th, 2011. Okay, so that letter that Peter Hackett wrote that we just read was May 2011, which was before her remains were found, right? That's what I'm saying. Oh, my word. This guy. Excellent mapping. Yes. Robert, isn't this amazing? This is like the best map I've ever seen of this. This must have been incredibly hard work. So shout out to Dan Denny. I followed him on Twitter too because I'm like, what? And then police arrest John Bitrolf on July 1st, 2014 for the two murders. Interesting. He lived in Manaville and DNA connected him to two of the victims, Rita Tangredi and Colleen McDammy. This is why he is a, he's, he's, he's quite the suspect in this case. John Bitrolf is convicted of the murders of Rita Tangredi and Colleen McNamee. So this is not part of the list victims we listed, but part of the ones that were listed before all of this happened which could be connected. Hello, Lieutenant Peter Pronzo. This is in your area, isn't it? What? And yeah, so those, that's, look at that. All these victims. I know Long Island isn't small, but still small enough to think, wow, this serial killer did all of this in this whole area. So with Manaville being this sort of like around this area here, this is where he operated here. So... That Bitrolf guy, between him and Dr. Peter Hackett, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so that is the one thing I wanted to show you. And if you look at the rest of that website, um, it's in my description box, okay? So afterwards, just go check there. I would highly recommend checking it out. There's also this, um, is it this one? Here's a really good one, too. If you want to deep dive even more and see what I've been spending the last, I don't know how long, looking at. The, the Gilgo case is called gilgocase.com, dedicated to the victims of the Long Island serial killer. 
$50,000 reward for info leading to the arrest. So you can see everything is here. There's a case summary, featured evidence with jewelry. There's pictures. There's everything. Lisk is such a great podcast. It is such a deep dive. I mean, there's 36 episodes and it is amazing. So I would highly recommend checking that out. There's obviously um, all kinds of documentaries and everything on it. So I would recommend this site too, which is also in my description box. And then the Suffolk County PD has actually made a website too, gilgonews.com. So here they've got home, the timeline, victims, Shannon Gilbert, evidence, archive, and submit a tip. So this is also really, really good. So check this out too. It's actually quite impressive. And anyone with information, call 1-800-220-TIPS. So you can look at everything here. If you go victims, discovery, and backgrounds, you can see the entire list of the victims of the Long Island serial killer, you know, or maybe multiple killers, but I think Lisk, hmm? That bit Rolf guy, mm, mm, mm. And then Shannon Gilbert's on a separate tab as well. So they talk about her case too. Known photographs of her, yes. We've looked at these from part one. So if you missed part one, please go check it out. And then the leather belt, this is the leather belt. So they say, Suffolk County Police released images of this belt, which was found at a Gilgo Beach crime scene during the initial investigation. The letters HM or WH are embossed in the leather. It's believed the belt was handled by the perpetrator and did not belong to any of the victims. So interesting, right? And then lastly, I want to show you this video, which is actually what they released. Um, now I'm thinking when, I think it was in 2010. This is a video of Megan Waterman checking out of a hotel. Her, the last, she was, this was the last time she was seen alive. So this is also something that was released as evidence later. Never before seen video released by Suffolk County Police could help solve the Gilgo Beach murder. Our victim, Megan Waterman, was wearing a yellow sweater and is shown both arriving and leaving the hotel. Different angles captured by surveillance cameras document one of the last times Megan Waterman was seen. The 22-year-old who advertised herself as an escort on Craigslist went missing in early June of 2010, soon after leaving the Holiday Inn Express in Hop Hop. Based on what we know right now, we believe she could leave the hotel that night to meet her killer. But the killer or killers responsible for Waterman's death and nearly a dozen other victims, many of whom were sex workers found along Ocean Parkway more than 10 years ago, still remains a mystery. The county police commissioner, Rodney Harrison, once more promised transparency in the case as he released the video. Also announced a revamped website and the doubling of rewards to fifty thousand dollars for information leading to an arrest and conviction in the case. We make this announcement in hopes somebody will come forward with information to help us find the person or people responsible for these homicides. But attorney John Ray, who represents Ken and Gilbert, the state still wants the nine one one tape from her disappearance to be made public. Commissioner Harrison is willing as long as it doesn't compromise the investigation. People panic when they see things on TV. And that's how the killers are going to possibly come forward themselves. And certainly that's how the public's going to catch it. The South County District Attorney's Office is aware of today's announcement and supports anything that will advance the investigation. Law enforcement officials encourage the public to submit and even resubmit any tips. Either through the Gilgo News website or the Crime Stoppers hotline. That number 800-220-TIPS. And there we have it, everyone. It's a horrendous case. I mean, it's so shocking. And it's not like, you know, like studying a serial killer that we know. We don't know who did this. We don't know who did this. So, yes. Thank you so much, everyone, for um, watching along with me, for watching the presentation that I made for you guys. Um, I really hope you enjoyed today's episode. This is the best way to support my work. Um, I've slowed down on playing my advert for a little bit, you know, one, it was annoying some people, two, I do realize not everyone has YouTube premium, I'd highly recommend it, <laughs> a friend recommended it to me, it's very important, I think it's like $10 a month, but it is so worth it to not have any adverts, I think I would die if I had to watch all these, all the research videos, everything that I watch, all the content I consume and have adverts in between, that must be so annoying. But I just know there is like maybe 80% of the audience might not have YouTube premium. 
then they're watching all these ads in between the episode and then my ad. I get it. I get it. So yeah, YouTube premium, I'm telling you, it's not sponsored at all. I'm just like, it's the bomb. So the best way to support my work, if you want to say thanks, of course, is PayPal, most direct way. Buy me a coffee. Patreon, of course, I just released a new forest, a spring forest waffle today. <laughs> if you want to see me walk around in the forests of the Netherlands or visit a castle, go to the canals. I gave all the YouTube uh, members a video yesterday. Please check the community tab so that you can find it there or check the members only playlist so that you can find all the videos that you need to catch up on. There's the um, Amersfoort walking tour that I did there for you guys and I edit all the videos and put it together and put in a lot of time and effort to make it really great for you. So yeah, these are all the ways. You could also get some merch. This is also Mental Health Awareness Month. And in my merch, I have a mental health range, which is a semicolon, which represents depression and uh, your story not being over. That's kind of what the message represents. So if you want to get a shirt um, that I think it says what Grizzlies, um, Grizzlies keep going uh, with a little semicolon in the middle, if you want to get yourself that to raise uh, awareness for mental health, then yes, uh, please feel free to go and do that as well. Thank you, Caroline, for your $5 super sticker. Of course, other ways to support are super stickers, super chats, the super thanks, which you can do after the video is finished. And uh, what else? I think that's about it. So thank you so, so much. Um, if you guys like audiobooks, of course, I wrote four books on serial killers. So that's why this case was of great interest to me. The Long Island Serial Killer, Unsolved. 12 years later, they released the 911 call of the missing person who was found deceased in the marsh. And finding that one person, before they found her, they uncovered the bodies of, or the remains, not bodies, it's remains at that point, of 10 other victims? Okay, so this case was of great interest to me because before I started YouTube, I wrote four books um, on serial killers and I was planning to do that for the rest of my life. <laughs> but then YouTube is just... I started YouTube and it's actually it's actually a lot more fun because it's interactive. You know, when you write a book, you put the book out and people click some stars. Thank you also. That reminds me to everyone who has rated my books and reviewed my books. I really, really appreciate it. Even my notebooks. Oh my word, you guys are so sweet. Thank you so much. So yes, this case, whew, it's like exactly what I would normally be into. Uh, just to quickly, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Marika, Marika, Marika. Thank you so much. Wanting this case is re-looked at over and over by law enforcement. I really hope so. It seems like they, they're putting some fresh energy into it as well. <laughs> I'm getting the backpack. Okay, no, don't make me jealous now. <laughs> I want the backpack. <laughs> we need one that says we need a trailer. <laughs> exactly. Someone is asking here, any updates on the Daniel Robinson case? I would highly recommend checking out the YouTube channel. Please help find Daniel, uh, Angel, because Mr. Robinson answers all questions there. Sometimes... Between three and five days a week, he does um, Q&As over there, and he answers everyone's questions over there and provides all the updates. Sadly, there are no updates at the moment. Um, Daniel has not been found. Ah, thank you, Lieutenant Peter Pranzo. Lieutenant Peter Pranzo's books also, also brilliant. Harlem Raiders. <laughs> yes. Okay. So thank you all for being here today. <laughs> yeah, pilot voice. <laughs> narrates yeah i also narrate my books i've got ebooks paperbacks and audiobooks and i also have a range of notebooks um, available for you to buy so yes this weekend we got a live stream right now and we're having another one tomorrow as soon as this live stream finishes it will lead you to the next one so please send set your reminder for tomorrow okay it's an hour earlier than today started so i will see you there we're gonna look at uh, the delphi case again and look at why i don't believe ron logan did it Yes. Okay. So we'll look at that. Even after we looked at that whole search warrant and affidavit, now we're going to look at the next angle. Okay. Yes, William. <laughs> I heard the word snarky used on another crime. Really? <laughs> wow. Well, thank you guys for, for joining me here today. It was so nice to see you. Please remember to, you know what really helps the content creator? A thumbs up comments below and sharing the episode that really helps a lot as well so viewing my videos is a great source of support thank you for viewing this video um, and i hope to see you share this on twitter and then i will like it and retweet it uh, it's at grizzly gizla on twitter i'm on instagram grizzly true crime i'm on tiktok grizzly true crime as well um, and all the other links you need are in my description box 
Thank you so much to all my mods, to my special ops team. Thank you to Lieutenant Peter Pranzo and Rochelle Pranzo for always being here too. It's so nice to have you here. And guys, I hope you have a wonderful Friday night ahead. I mean, for me, what's the time now? It's quarter past 12 at night. Huh? <laughs> I hope you have a, a wonderful evening, afternoon, whatever it is ahead. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Okay. Stay safe and keep it snarky and keep it grizzly. <laughs>